Well, thank you so much for having me present and kick things off this morning. Uh, my name is Colin Siren, and I head up, uh, as uh, I was introduced, I head up the Ag and Animal Health Group for Canada. Uh, I've been with Ipsos for about 12 years, and over that time started off, um, I think 90% of our business at that time was based in Canada, and over that time I've seen that business sort of follow the same global trend of agriculture. And uh, these days I'd say that uh, our, our group is expanded. We've got offices in South America and France and in St. Louis, Missouri, and our uh, business these days is about a third uh, Canadian, a third U.S., and a third global. So today I'm presenting to you <clears throat> results of a, a really important study for the industry. It's uh, the dollars and cents study that was, uh, that was uh, conducted uh, by us uh, in collaboration with Rob Hannum and uh, on behalf of uh, Farm, um, uh, FMC and uh, AMI. And just to give you a little bit of background on me and why we were selected uh, to, uh, to partner in this research, back in uh, 2011 we conducted a baseline study on farm business management practices for the AMI, in which case we really revealed and, under, uh, and, and understood the landscape and where farmers were at this time. And we're actually planning to, uh, to conduct that study again uh, in, in 2016. What this study in 2011 didn't do, though, was push one step further in order to try and identify the drivers of behavior, the drivers of success, and really trying to identify does planning matter. matter. And it sounds like such a strange question because anecdotally we know that it matters to go to post-secondary uh, school, we know that it matters to be organized. All these things sound like they contribute to farm financial success and to business success across all categories, but very difficult to be able to, uh, to identify this, uh, this relationship and prove it statistically. And my first real experience in this area was in a study that we commissioned uh, by Bayer Animal Health in the United States. This was an extremely large study uh, conducted in, uh, in collaboration with Bracky Consulting. And you may be asking me right now, why is this guy talking about U.S. companion animal veterinarians at a, at a conference design for farmers? And it was interesting because we analyzed the same information, looking at a sector that's driven by entrepreneurs, a sector with ever-increasing technical and capital requirements, an audience that, de that generally did not choose the profession because they loved being business managers, and a sector that had top performers along with those who were struggling. And so this experience combined with the baseline study made us a strong candidate for the study and research that was done uh, this past year. So going back to 2011, we did some focus groups with farmers and asked farmers how they felt about business management practices. And this little sort of chart on the left-hand side with the cartoons shows that how do farmers feel about farm business planning back in 2011? Well, we knew that they were curious, that they were inspired, and they were confident, but at the same time, <clears throat> they were skeptical uh, and uh, overwhelmed and just not sure. So there was this sort of duality to farm business management planning. Sure, I'm eager and interested, but at the same time, I'm skeptical and confused and not sure where to turn to. We also followed it up with a, with a quantitative approach to the study where we looked at the types of planning activities that were most conducted. And we found that farmers were most likely to uh, have engaged in succession planning, business planning, risk management planning, and so on down the list. What was really revealing, though, was the degree to which we had variability. We had people who had engaged in multiple training type activities and were really managing their businesses with a high degree of business acumen. And we had, to, uh, had several segments, significant segments, totaling to about 40% of farmers that were just not as engaged and for many, many reasons. And so after this research, uh, we basically took a step back and said, well, how do we motivate uh, adoption of farm uh, business, pack, uh, business planning practices? because we know that there's such a wide range of, uh, of motivators. Some farmers during that research told us they wanted more time with their family. Some knew that they wanted to have a viable enterprise to be able to pass along to the next generation of farmers. Some were looking for uh, more cash at the end of the day, more financial security. And so what we settled on for this research was really focusing on tangible benefits. We can't really provide, you know, analyze you know, freedom of time and how organized you are, how satisfied you are with your life and so forth and your well-being. What we really wanted to focus and deliver for industry was how farm business management planning activities drive tangible benefits and, in essence, dollars and cents. And that's really why the study is called the Dollars and Cents Study. And some of the things that we approached the project team from the onset was, well, how can it be done? We have so many different ownership structures. We have differences in weather conditions. We have, plan uh, we have a different sort of, uh, you know, some people are naturally planners, some are naturally implementers, and certainly to be successful, you need to be a combination of both. 
you know, luck plays a big role. And finally, we have in Canada, we have such a wide range of commodity groups and, and really the uh, you know, supply management categories as well. You know, certainly there there be some challenges in terms of being able to find a one size fits all approach, being able to understand farm financial success and to prove that business business management practices matter. And so we looked at other research that had been done, and no, really nowhere, and and outside of agriculture included, had done a lot of had done studies that were conclusive and, and able to prove this relationship exists. And there's a number of issues that, that present themselves when we looked at some of the, uh, the standing research. Uh, some studies were only conducted in one agricultural sector, and so we weren't able to extrapolate across, a, uh, across the country, across more than one sector. They were very narrow in their scope. Uh, other studies were conducted with very small sample sizes, sample sizes of 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. And so we knew that even though they may have established a relationship, they weren't really going to pass the muster of the general population of farmers in terms of looking at the results and saying, you know what, I can see myself in that result. I believe in it because it's a study that has statistical rigor behind it. We also saw other studies were conducted with unreliable or biased methodologies. A lot of academic research, and it's really, it is really good research, but it's being conducted by students in a, in, with, with, uh, that don't have access to uh, uh, the types of services and data collection that a company like Ipsos has. And then finally, there's just studies that were unable to provide a statistical relationship. So they weren't able to uh, take the data and analyze it and be able to identify the relationship between planning and profitability or financial success indeed existed. So our purpose was to really overcome these obstacles and to be able to provide a study that met all of these requirements that we felt hadn't been met in previous research and to ultimately identify the drivers of farm financial success. So we approached it, first of all, with a statistically reliable and representative sample frame. At Ipsos, that's by and large what we do. And as the leading agricultural research company in Canada, we have a panel of 120,000 farms to be able to derive our sample from. And we understand through Statistics Canada and the Ag Census how, how, the, how the, uh, the, the population is distributed across Canada to be able to ensure that we have representation. We have high quality and unbiased data collection processes through our call center uh, and also through online. We've got ways of collecting data in a, in a way that it reduces bias and further we're professionals in the sense that we know how to design good questions to be able to elicit results that, are, uh, that can withstand scrutiny. Uh, we were able to uh, conduct a survey instrument that gathered both farm financial information and management activity on a farm. And this is one of the biggest things that we were worried about at the onset of the research was, was were farmers going to share their personal information and sales information, really uh, personal information about their farm business with us, a total stranger over the phone. And we were able to find that the, actually the response rate was extremely high for this study and the refusal rate was very low. And when we looked at the results in terms of comparing size of operation, uh, the commodities that were being farmed in that, in that operation, the revenue that was being generated and the cost of goods sold, certainly we had some outliers, but we went line item by line item and identified uh, outliers that we felt weren't either honest or weren't people that maybe knew their business and we eliminated them. And then we conducted an innovative driver analysis uh, that identified the key drivers of farm financial success and thus established this relationship. And so the good news really is, is that we did it. And this is a significant uh, undertaking and I think a really significant accomplishment for the project team to be able to uh, establish this relationship that a lot of researchers have endeavored to approach and, and haven't been able to, uh, to achieve in the past. So just to answer a few questions about our methodology, because I think that this was really one of the primary um, shortcomings of a lot of the other research that we identified during our scan. And so the way that we approached our study was we conducted it in three phases. The first phase, we conducted in-depth interviews. So myself and my colleague, Kate Stiefelmeyer, reached out to key stakeholders in the industry. And what we wanted to identify was, uh, the, where, was to try and establish, was there indeed a sort of one-size-fits-all description of farm financial success that we would be able to utilize? The second one was, is there a national database of, let's say, tax data that we would be able to uh, derive from and be able to have very concrete information to be able to draw upon? The answers to both those questions was no. There's no uniform uh, 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 definition of farm financial success that all of the parties we spoke with identified as being the correct and, and go-to uh, calculation, which gave us the freedom to be able to develop our own. In core, in sort of certainly in, in collaboration with some of the results that we that we had already heard. Secondly, there's no database that was that was publicly available that we would be able to consult. So we would have to establish our own database of financial measures. 
Uh, the people we spoke to throughout that process were farm, uh, farm advisors and stakeholders, government program administrators, uh, and uh, farm business representatives at accounting firms and banks. We then developed a survey in, co in collaboration with FMC and AMI, and uh, we then pre-tested it. So myself again and, and uh, my colleague got on the phone and started calling farmers using our design survey to be able to see, did farmers really share the information? Were we confident just with their intonation and their, their, the way that they spoke on the phone? Did, they, we, did we feel that we could trust them in the information we got? And so we did in-depth interviews and felt very, very good that A, the project was feasible and the farmers would share this information, and B, that it was, uh, there was information that we would get with a, with a relatively high degree of, of accuracy, or at least directional accuracy. And so, the, um, uh, and then so finally we fielded a, a quantitative study with 604 farmers across Canada uh, using both uh, the option for online or telephone to be able to, to complete the study. And after the fact, as I said, we went through the entire data set and reviewed and, and compared all uh, financial information against basically normalized data to identify outliers and remove them. And we had less, a little less than 10%. So this is our sample frame. So 604 farms. And we have the ability within the data set to uh, make comparisons between commodity groups and between provinces. There's a lot of numbers on that slide. But so I can't, I can't tell you in the data set that hog farmers versus uh, poultry and egg farmers in Atlantic Canada, that there's a statistically significant difference because, you know, we only got five people of uh, one group and two of another. But certainly I can compare the 56 far hog farmers overall against the 55 poultry and egg farmers to see if there's differences between those groups. And similarly, between all the provinces, we can do that as well. Those of you who, are, who know the ag census really well will look at this and say, well, that's not representative of Canadian farming. You've got way too many hog farmers, way too many poultry farmers. And that's true. And so what this is, is we then weight the data. We uh, look at this. This is allowing for us to do subgroup analysis. But when all of our results are analyzed at the total or aggregated level, we weight the farms that we have too many of down to their proportions. And the farms that we have too few of, we weight them up to their proportions. So that we've covered ourselves in terms of being able to have a reliable national study. And the report contains national findings, which are weighted based on the concentrations of farms by type and by province, as well as farms uh, within each province and by type to be able to compare and make statistically meaningful comparisons. And that brings us into the driver analysis part. And so this is where things get a little bit technical. And so I'll try as best I can in about 10 minutes to walk you through uh, a report that's about 100 pages long and, and, is, and contains a lot of information. And so the purpose of this presentation is to really introduce these results and findings to the group. And with the spirit of, we've got something really special here. AMI and FMC, I know, are absolutely willing to engage, and we're willing to support them as well to help those of you in the room who want to have a conversation about the results. We want to be able to do that and, and to be able to support those discussions because we want we feel good about the results and we know that they're defensible. Um, but today's not perhaps not the best venue to be able to do that, just because I've only got uh, 10 minutes to walk you through a pretty technical part of the discussion. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions afterwards, so so forgive me as I as I proceed. So the first part is that we needed to conduct uh, a driver, uh, develop a driver model. And so the way to think of a driver model is that you need a dependent variable. In this case, the dependent variable was farm financial success. So we needed in our data to be able to derive and develop a, a score for each individual farm that says, how successful are you relative to your peers based on the data we have? Then we take all of the other data in the data set and we basically see which of those other attributes in the data are drivers? If things that, if they're present, result in more farm financial success. Things that are absent result in less farm financial success. And so based on that, that's basically the structure of which I'm going to talk to you about. And so the farm financial success score is really the underpinning for the entire, the entire driver model. And it's a custom measure that we developed. Uh, that allows us to identify the degree to which a farm is successful versus its peers. And the way we developed is we collected four measures from all of our farmers. We, get, we gathered um, gross farm sales, cost of goods sold, total assets, and total debts. Certainly, in a perfect world, we would have been able to have a two-hour conversation with each farmer and gone through their information across the, the kitchen table, but it really wasn't really feasible for this study and, and within the time frames and the budget and everything else. And so we really relied on these four metrics to be able to, to be our inputs. We used those four metrics to run a series of ratios, and then we indexed every farm within its farm type, so you're being indexed against your peers. 
so that the, uh, the this farm financial success score is a score from 0 to 100. The top farm in the category would receive a perfect score of 100, and the bottom farm in the category would receive a score of 0. And this allows us to be able to say, okay, we're able to identify differentiation between the data set. We can look at those at the top and compare those at the bottom to see if there's any differences in the way that they approach their farm business management planning, how many, the types of activities they engage in, how they feel about farm, uh, about, about business planning activities, et cetera. And this is a, a sort of an overlay of the measures that we use. There's a lot of information on the slide, but basically from the report we have all of the ratios. You'll notice that one of the, so, and what we were able to do is, uh, first, the, the first time we ran the, the metrics, we used five inputs to our uh, to our, uh, our our farm farm financial success measure, but we quickly realized that debt created problems in the data, because debt is something that you can inherit your farm and have zero debt, or it's something that you can work hard to achieve over the course of your career to have no debt in your farm. And so, by having a score from zero to one hundred, by giving all farmers that had zero uh, that had no long term debt a perfect score of hundred, we found it completely eliminated the variance in our model. And so what we ultimately decided on is we needed to pull that out of the out of the equation because it just wasn't providing meaningful differentiation in the results and was creating too much noise, as my uh, uh, my statistical analyst said. And we decided to go with three measures to include in our farm su success score. And those are right in the green uh, text there, midway through the screen. So you can see what we used was we used an in an index for return on assets plus the index for gross margin ratio plus the index for asset turnover and we divided it by three. And that gave each farmer a score from zero to 100 and gave them their farm financial success score. And we conducted a number of different uh, analytical steps to see if it was actually working. So the first thing we needed to do was, did we have it see an even distribution from zero to 100? Or did we see a pocket of farms at the top and maybe two or three at the bottom? We didn't find that. In all commodity groups, we have an even distribution using this approach across the spectrum. So we truly have a top quartile and a bottom quartile that are meaningful of size and are, and, and, and are differentiated in terms of the way they approach business management activities. And this brought us to the bottom uh, of the slide here. You can see that there's this chart where what we wanted to do was we wanted to conduct a driver analysis that basically looks at the bottom quarter of Canadian farms in terms of their farm financial success and, the, and what are the drivers that were, are going to be the differentiating characteristics that will drive them upwards to be the top 25% of farms. And so that's really what we're seeing here on the next slide is what are the key drivers that drive the bottom 25% to the top 25% and in order for a driver to be significant, there has to be difference in behavior. So where are the biggest differences in behavior between the low 25 and the top 25? And you can see on this list that we divide, we identified seven drivers that are have a, have a strong enough statistical relationship to be considered as, uh, that, it is a, that it is a driver. And the top three are stronger than the following four. And the top three are a desire for lifelong training and knowledge, uh, level of detail in your accounting system that supports decision making, including uh, well organized and up to date financial reports, use of uh, business advisors, and then we see a, a slightly lower group in terms of its, uh, its uh, driver strength, which is uh, formal, bi bi formal written business plan, cost of production monitoring, uh, uh, assess and manage risk, and financial having a financial plan in place. When I look at this list, I don't see something that I don't see anything that's really controversial here. You know, and that was sort of the first sort of pa the, uh, test that we have to apply as statisticians, statisticians when we look at data is, does this seem to make sense? Well, it's not surprising to me that someone who has a desire for lifelong learning is going to be perhaps more financially successful than, than someone who maybe does not have that opinion because they're going to be more innovative. And over the course of their career, especially with a farm demographic that we have that's, that's sort of certainly uh, above average in terms of age in comparison to the general population, Someone who's had a lifelong commitment to learning and development is not surprising is going to do outperform someone who, who hasn't had that same, that same belief system. The level of detail from your accounting system to make financial decisions, I mean, this to me is a no-brainer. If you don't have up-to-date financial reports, I don't know how you could possibly run a business and be able to take risks, educated risks, or to be able to make meaningful decisions in terms of how to manage, uh, how to manage your farm business. 
and then using business advisors, I think it's you know perhaps the the, the real strength of someone is when they understand to themselves that that they don't under they don't know how to do everything themselves, and they reach out to people who are knowledgeable and able to provide training and and support and uh, take over services or aspects they're not as good at. So from my perspective, this is a driver model that makes very good sense and it's meaningful. It's also something I think that F AMI and FMC and the rest of the stakeholders in this room, this is a message I think that's very, uh, that's meaningful and, 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 uh, and, and can be uh, easily communicated to farmers in your sector. Certainly the farm financial success score and all the stuff, the egghead stuff that I walked through earlier, I mean certainly we can get into a debate about that, but this driver system is is very easy to communicate in terms of the what we're calling the sort of seven habits of highly success, uh, financially successful farmers. And what's even more important is that it cuts across all ag uh, sectors. So when we looked at our data set, we didn't just find that the supply management guys were outperforming everybody else financially because we designed the analysis to uh, be able to create indexes within each farm type. So the top farmers on a ca uh, on a beef cattle operation are being analyzed in the same way as the top performers of a dairy cattle operation in terms of their score. And so we found that across all farm types, we, uh, with or without su supply management, this driver system holds true. We see it also as true across all, drive, uh, all agricultural regions, across the full range of, uh, of, of age groups. Certainly there's some uh, sort of statistical shift and differences from one, one group to the next. But we do see an overall trend that it's not just the supply management guys that are that are outperforming. It's not just uh, uh, Quebec with Azra and some some of the t programs to support financial success in Quebec that we're seeing success there. It's not just young farmers or old farmers that don't have any debt. It's not just large farms that are outperforming small farms. We still have a very sizable concentration of very small farms that are in the top quartile in terms of their financial performance and are doing well and we're seeing the same types of drivers that, that drive that success. And also whether or not the farm has off-farm household income is also uh, not a significant determinant of whether a farm is successful. Certainly, I'm sure it certainly helps. It helps in my household. But, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and so if we look at these habits, I've gone over these already. Um, in terms of the difference in behavior we saw, so a commitment to learning. So farms in the bottom quartile are three times more likely not to seek out new information, training, or learning opportunities. In terms of the financial decision-making process, farms in the bottom quartile are three times more likely to have farm, farm financial records that are uh, months behind and not used on a regular basis for decision making. Farms in the bottom quartile are three times more likely not to monitor cost of production and use it for benchmarking and management decisions. Farms in the bottom uh, top quartile are 30% more likely to work regularly with a trusted farm business advisor or team of advisors and farms in the top quartile are almost 50% more likely to have a formal written business plan that is reviewed and updated annually. It comes back to the seven habits of, of uh, financially successful farms. We can see real differences in the adoption rates of these practices between those top performers and the bottom quartile of performers who are likely struggling financially. And so this next section really comes into, but is it tangible? So what is the difference in the financial ratios we saw between the bottom farms and the top farms? And the text is relatively small, and the lighting's not great, but I can walk you through it. So the top row is asset turnover. And you can see that if we look at all farms, the average asset turnover among the bottom quartile is 9.7%. Among the top quartile, it's 20%. So we see over 100% improvement in asset turnover. In terms of gross margin turnover, we see, again, more than 100% improvement, 150% uh, improvement in terms of gross margin ratio, sorry. And lastly, return on assets, we see it, uh, a, a very, very significant improvement, a 500% improvement in the return on assets between the top farms and the, lo and the low farms. So if you start to see the picture that we're painting here, we've got our segments. We've looked at our segments. We see their financials are very, very different. We see their behaviors in, ter in terms of business pl uh, management planning are also significantly differentiated. And for the first time in a study that I'm aware of, we're able to develop and understand that there is a statistical relationship between these things. And uh, in my opinion, common sense things, that, but we have this relationship now and can prove that there are tangible benefits to, uh, to farm, uh, uh, farm business planning. 
So in terms of conclusions, from our perspective, it's, you know, the first thing that we went to is, well, is this really the study defensible? Because the study is the first of its kind to be able to identify this relationship, is it defensible? Well, we know looking back at our checklist of things uh, that were, um, that were shortcomings of other studies, we know our study is statistically reliable and representative. We know that we've used uh, the best in class approach for collecting data short of sitting and doing an audit with every single farm in our sample frame, which wasn't feasible. We know that we've developed a farm financial success score as a dependent variable that's consistent what, with what our stakeholders told us during the first phase of the research and is also uh, meaningful in terms of uh, when we look at the results in the data, it doesn't provide any meaning, uh, any obvious weaknesses in terms of skews in the data uh, that, uh, that would suggest that it's not reliable. And we have a driver s analysis system that is also state of the art. It's based on an, uh, on an Ipsos BasenNets approach, which, is, uh, d which was uh, developed in 2014 and is considered one of the cornerstones of Ipsos' statistical analysis offer. So it's very, very reliable and robust. And then proof that these drivers are related with desirable outcomes. Well, we can see it in the behaviors and we can see it in the financial ratios that we see at the end. And, we, and these are examples of those, the 525% increase in return on assets, 155% increase in gross margin ratio, and then other significant improvements as well. And so what we've really identified here is, um, you know, moving forward is from our perspective is we want to engage and support the discussion about these results because it is uh, controversial or at least it engages people and creates discussion and so our purpose is to support FMC and AMI as those discussions continue. Our, uh, we also want to be able to support the message and getting this message out. It's, you know, this type of information is, is I'm sure is interesting to those in the room, uh, but we need to be able to identify and get out and provide communications that target those who are struggling and, sh and utilize these inf this information in a succinct and uncomplicated way to demonstrate that it matters. Because these people in the bottom quartile who are in other research and focus groups that we looked at, who, uh, they're the people that aren't, they're not interested in uh, me walking through a 25 page uh, presentation deck that finally gets them to the, the, the improvement. What really matters to them is the tangible benefit and being able to communicate in a meaningful way that also confirms that it, it's, 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 we found this in farms that were just like them. And so those are the uh, all the slides I have today. I've probably got a minute or two left for a question or two. A couple questions, if there's any from the floor. I think it's an interesting study here in, in regards to the level of uh, uh, planning that farmers are engaging on on their farm. But my question is, is in regards to the formal versus the informal planning, and I'm just wondering um, how you make that uh, or maybe it's a question for the audience in terms of how we make that relatable to farmers. As a farmer myself and as a, as a lender, it's a conversation that we have time and time again. And one of the big challenges that I have with formal business planning is I have uh, customers that will provide an extensive business plan, but they're not accountable to it. And I think they bec that becomes very overwhelming for them. And as a lender, I'd rather have a, a very simple business plan that might be less formal, but really they, they have a lot more ownership. And in a sense, it's much more relatable. And, um, and so I think there's a something to be said about not making these kinds of uh, presentations overwhelming, but rather uh, making them relatable and meaningful to, uh, to farmers yeah. so they'll actually uptake. I totally agree. And I think that there's also, um, there's a risk in this to say, well, you know, just having a formal bit written business plan, that's going to make me successful. And that's, that's certainly not true. You need, it's more than that. You know, you have, it's, it's the, the, you know, cert, because certainly as you just mentioned, having an informal plan that's well understood by the operation and, and is achievable and implementable is perhaps more meaningful than something that's overtly complex and, um, and uh, that all the stakeholders on the farm don't, either don't understand or are unable to, to implement within a reasonable time frame. So from our perspective, it's, uh, I like this idea of, uh, of the seven habits of highly successful farms because it focuses on doing many things, the sort of composition of things, especially those top three things, which are relatively easy to remember and, uh, and, to, uh, and that we know now and can fall back on a study and say, no, they do drive farm financial success because we've, we've been able to prove that relationship exists. Thank you very much. I feel smarter now. Uh, thanks, Colin. That was uh, at, 
the hundred pages, I imagine there's a, a lot. Also, provide a lot more insight to anybody who's looking for the uh, get into the uh, the minutia of, uh, of what we what we now know to be true. Uh, coming up next, uh, Hugh Maynard's going to uh, re return after a one-day hiatus. He was the uh, uh, consulting specialist and owner of Quangle Communications and Consulting. And uh, Hugh's going to uh, lead us through the uh, Farming in 2050, 2050 discussion panel. Thank you, Michael. And I'd invite our panelists to come up and take your seats. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Ça va? Good? Are we there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> Just making sure. For those of you who weren't here earlier on or weren't paying attention, my name is Hugh Maynard and um, helping out with uh, moderation of the different panels and uh, uh, procedures uh, over the couple of days with, with Michael. We have a panel discussion coming up for about an hour. Um, just in terms of process, we'll have a presentation from each of the, the panelists and then we'll have an open session for questions. So please uh, make sure you take a few notes and uh, should be pretty interesting. Um, farming in 2050 is going to be the point of focus. And by 2050, I will be somewhere approaching 100 years old, um, which I feel pretty good right now. <laughs> But, you know, life has its twists and turns, and what are the certainties, possibilities, probabilities that I'm going to make it to 100? We don't know. Um, in the same vein, it's also possible that the Toronto Maple Leafs could win the Stanley Cup. Who knows? You know, it's, it's not a probability. It's a possibility. Won't place any money on that. But what we do know, a very strong probability, is that by 2050 there will be nine or more billion people on this planet, probably more, and they are all going to want to eat. And not only are they going to want to eat, they're going to want to eat like we do, three square meals a day, um, and a much higher quality diet than what many of the people in the world today enjoy. And it's going to be a significant challenge to produce, prepare, distribute, uh, that food uh, to that number of people around the world in an adequate way that we could say with some sense of social justice that everybody is is well fed and um, The big challenge personally, I believe that we're going to be able to do that um, uh, Our challenge is going to be not to destroy the earth in the process, but that's a whole other question So we're going to focus on 2050 and what should we expect and what should we prepare Please feel free to predict the future if you dare, but we'll stick with expectations and ideas. And just uh, to introduce our panelists, we have Dan Holman from Holman Farming Group here in Saskatchewan, a grain and pulse producer. Um, we have uh, Richard Phillips, who has worked uh, over the years for many agricultural organizations institutions and is currently a federal a lobbyist to the federal government in, uh, in Ottawa, Ottawa. And we have uh, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Rob or Robert? Rob Sake, Mr. Sake, who is president of AgriTrends. Many of you know him. He's spoken at many conferences. He's an agricultural consultant. And uh, without further ado, you have 10, 12 minutes each, and we'll start with Dan. Thank you, Hugh. Well, good morning. <laughs> so I want to start off with uh, uh, kind of uh, I, I, I grappled with this idea of trying to predict what's going to look like in 2050. Uh, I'll still be uh, uh, hopefully actively farming and, and, and in my 60s, so it, it is it's something that is uh, very relevant to me. Um, but I also found it fascinating is uh, is uh, is how uh, rugged our industry is because. If you look back um, over the last 100 years or so, the, the why we do what we do hasn't really changed. We're taking the sun's energy and basically converting it into, into human energy. And a good example of this, and it really struck home with me, was uh, one of our customers uh, is a flour mill in Calgary, and we were hauling some, some wheat to him this fall. And the mill is 100 years old, a concrete facility. So 100 years ago, there have been farmers delivering wheat to this facility. 
being milled into flour and, and sent into uh, consumers' homes to make bread. Um, it was probably with a horse and a, and a buggy. Uh, we were with a set of super bees, a lot bigger volume, but the overall uh, why what we're doing is the same, taking wheat and making it into flour, feeding people. Of course, the how is changed every day. Um, and I think it's helpful uh, for the purpose of my presentation to break change into two, uh, two, um, two categories. The first uh, is incremental change, so kind of change along a continuum. So you can think of uh, maybe an, I an iPhone perhaps going from an iPhone uh, for um, and a transformational change is one where if you don't adopt, uh, you basically you're taken out of the business. So the introduction of a smartphone, uh, I would call that a transformational change. So sitting in 1945, and basically what I did is I took 35-year tranches uh, back from 2015 because we're going to go 35 years ahead. Well, we'll go 70 years back. And, and one of our key employees, uh, Lori Bergen, uh, really helped me a lot putting this together. Uh, so sitting in 1945, uh, looking forward to 1980, these are the transformation, uh, transformative changes that you would have had to overcome to stay in business. Um, in agronomy, we started using chemicals to a greater degree and, uh, and fertilizers, Green Revolution. Uh, equipment went from steel wheels to rubber. Uh, implements used hydraulics, articulated tractors. And the, the big one on the management side was the 60s, uh, getting through that with uh, very low quota years. So how did you manage your cash flow to your farm? Did you, uh, did you have off-farm income? Did you create a manufacturing plant? Did you feed animals? What did you do in the 60s to get through? That was a big transformative change that took some farms out and gave others opportunities. Then we move up to 1980, looking forward over the next 35 years. So to get uh, get the transformative changes right, uh, you would have had to uh, figure out uh, um, all the chemicals that come off. And generic glyphosate was a big one. Um, the crops that we that we we uh, created and adapted, uh, canola, lentils, and peas. Um, Al Slinkard, the work he did with lentils in the early 80s. I mean that changed uh, our farm, but also changed a lot of farms in the in the lentil growing areas. Uh, zero till and continuous cropping. And then on the equipment side, the whole air, seeding, air seeder delivery system, uh, it's changed the way you can uh, run equipment now. Instead of just having boxes, now we can have a lot bigger machines. And uh, it, it changed quite a lot there if you didn't adapt that technology. Now on the management side, um, high interest rates in the 80s was definitely a transformative change. If you couldn't manage through that, your farm was no longer in business. Um, I would argue two record low real prices in the 2000s, so inflation adjusted commodity prices also uh, hurt a lot of farms and, and the, some had opportunities to get through and, and some didn't. Um, BSC would be one. Uh, this presentation is mostly specific on grain and seed farming in Saskatchewan, so there's, I'm not, uh, not omitting the livestock challenges, but I'm just not as familiar with them. So that's the past stuff. Let's move on to the fun future stuff. Uh, for agronomy and equipment, I mean, we'll talk about a few incremental changes. And on the management side, uh, incremental changes uh, for human resources um, in the supply chain and in whole business succession. And then I'll spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what the next transformative event, what's the next rate train coming down the tracks that, that uh, will affect our business that we'll have to navigate through. So on the agronomy side, uh, there's publications coming every day, um, whether it be written stuff like The Producer or, um, or, or other publications that are telling us uh, uh, what, uh, what, is, what is happening on the agronomy side. And, and we rest assured we're going to see better genetics in the next uh, 35 years. We're going to see probably new crops being introduced, and, uh, the ones we haven't even really considered, maybe may the norm. Uh, we're going to see better fertility, and we're also going to see better pesticides. What those look like is, is not, not completely clear, but they're going to be better. And just as farm managers, and this is where we'll definitely have to rely on, on uh, uh, outside expertise, is just have to make good, good decisions on whether we adopt and include these uh, in our farming businesses. On the farm equipment side, um, the trends that are in place I think will still continue. We're going to see more, more automation, um, more measurement and data gathering. Every, every day that seems to go past, we have uh, more things come up with sensors and, and just ways of gathering data. And we're also going to become more precise than we already are. Already, we've taken great steps in, in being precision on, on nutrient management and chemical applications and seeding. Uh, that trend is just going to keep continuing. And again, we'll have to make good science economic-based decisions whether we adopt these changes. 
So on the human resource side, this is one question that I want to, uh, some input from everybody. We have all this data coming at us all the time, and uh, Dr. Eric, uh, uh, Michaels from the US, he had the same uh, comment from, from Drucker in, in his uh, presentation yesterday. But so from a farm management point of view, do we take all this data and how do we analyze it? How do we get value of it? And what is the proper way of doing it? Do we develop our in-house expertise? Like we have a farm mechanic, so do you have a data analyst on your farm and he's being supported by, uh, by a farm management company? Or do you completely outsource it to a data management company? And what are the implications of those? Um, if data management becomes as important as I think everybody thinks it is, do you want a hold up problem or do you want another company basically controlling the keys to that data? Or do you want to develop in-house or is there some sort of partnership that, that works together? But I think this is something uh, we, need to, we need to sort out. On the labor side, um, I think we need to be able to harness the the technology and the automation that's coming to get more returns uh, from our labor, to make them more productive, so we can provide a better standard of living, provide a better wage. I always think that with labor shortages, there's never really a shortage of labor, there's only a shortage of labor at a very low price. So if we can find ways of being able to pay our workers more, uh, I, I think it creates a bigger pie for everybody. Maybe we'll see a new class of uh, farm laborers develop. You've got your truck drivers, you've got your equipment operators, or maybe your data, data analysts or data keepers will be the uh, staff members on the farm. This is a big one for me, and I was disappointed to see it was way down on your list, Colin, about supply chain. But <laughs> I, uh, I think farmers are uniquely positioned. Okay, I got a couple minutes. Uh, farmers are uniquely positioned in the supply chain. Basically, we've got um, our customers uh, downstream who want to use our product to make food all year round, and we've got our input suppliers um, downstream from us who basically want to run their factories producing fertilizer, chemicals, or, or, or what have you all year round. But everything needs to be on the farm for an input side in kind of three weeks in the spring, and everything needs to be stored on the farm for three or four weeks in the fall when we're harvesting. So basically you've got this concentration of the supply chain right around the farm. And I think that presents uh, uh, opportunities, uh, if, if you will. But I think what needs to happen is, as a farm, we need to understand what our customers are looking for. And right now there's a void. Uh, we don't understand what our export customers are doing. And this is important because Canada is dependent on, Western Canada in particular, is completely dependent on exports of grain to set our prices. So the exports of grain um, sets the market clearing price because we're a net exporter. So we need to have an understanding of when our customers are buying grain and what times of year that is. And right now, that signal is not getting through because we've got the grain companies, the exporters in the middle. So I think it, export sales information is a public good that needs to be made available. And I think once it is, it'll prevent, or sorry, it will uh, create more opportunities for farmers who understand that. So I pose the question too, what else can farms do to add value within the supply chain? Okay, so succession, this is something I'm, I'm uh, uh, really interested in, of course, but this is a, a chart, um, 1960 to, to current uh, values. And what I do is I, I've got uh, US ho house equity and the US farm equity. And what I put up there, it just is a overall um, trying to grasp with the dollar values in, 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 in here. And what, what we're seeing is a, is a doubling from 60 to, to 87, and then another doubling from 87 to, uh, to 0, 0, 04 or so, and then another doubling from 04 now. So it's exponential growth in equity, not only on farms, but also in overall households too. So that's shortness of doubling times each year, so it's increasing at an increasing rate. And this is the same data set, or similar data for Canada. I couldn't find as good a data, but the red line there is housing value, and the blue line is total equity on farms. The black line is total farmland value. So in the last 10 years, we've seen um, housing values basically double, and uh, farm uh, value actually more than double. So equity and assets, uh, correspondingly, are going, uh, going vertical. And then... Um, Actually, breaking it out into quartiles, like Colin did, is actually a little more uh, revealing. I've got the industry averages here. Of course, there's top farms and, and lower farms in this, but 
basically return on Canadian farm assets is going down. So if you see asset values going up and returns going down, those are two uh, trends that I don't know if necessarily can continue. What also is happening is uh, management unit growth on farms is also increasing. If you take a look at what, uh, like our farm was in, in, uh, started in 1908, from 1908 to 1960, uh, my great grandpa would have managed about 21,000 acres in his lifetime. And from 61 to 04, uh, my grandpa managed about uh, 73,000 acres in his lifetime. And uh, if you look at what our family has done in the last uh, 11 years, we're, we're right around 98,000 acres we've, we've managed. So if you sum up what the farm has done in the last 11 years, that's more than the previous 90. Is that a sustainable trend too? I don't know. So I think this prevents an interesting uh, outcome. When we look at succession planning and moving businesses forward, will the, will the whole of the farm be worth more than the parts? Because traditionally we've always parted out a farm or, or made it available. Um, how can we cycle equity through the generations versus uh, each, generation having to, each generation having to buy it? Um, can we learn from the multi-generation? Uh, uh, grain companies are a great example. We've got these uh, large private uh, companies like Parrish and Heimbecker, uh, Patterson and Richardson, and I look on with, with envy with what these companies have done as family businesses. They've kept it all in-house, and they've basically grown this, uh, this large empire, but it's all family-owned. How do they do this? I think we need to learn a little bit about that. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> Just one more. One minute. So the next next transformative change is what's going to be happening. Next negative interest rates, government restrictions on input innovation, years of low prices. What what's the next freight train coming down the, the tracks that we gotta look after? So thank you. Thank you, Dan. And now we'll have Richard Phillips who's gonna talk about the relationship between government and farmers. Excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks again to Heather for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Richard Phillips. I'm originally from Tisdale, Saskatchewan. We had a seed farm up there for many years. Some of you might know my father, Claire Phillips. And i uh, worked for a number of agricultural associations, worked for quite a number of years at the Canadian Food Grains Bank, an international uh, aid organization with close ties to a lot of agriculture. And I worked for a couple of provincial cabinet ministers, federal cabinet ministers, worked in opposition, been around the hill a lot. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good Parliament Hill expression. I've been around the hill a lot. All right. So, agriculture and government. So let's very quickly again, 40 years by the numbers, 360,000 farmers in 71, 205,000 in 2011 in the last uh, census, 57% drop. At this rate, we'll have 116,000 farmers in Canada in 40 years. Uh, the rate is slowing, but you know, maybe we'll end up around 150,000 farmers by that time, which is kind of the time frame I'm looking out at. Uh, Stats can projects over 40 million people in Canada by 2050, so we'll be a very, very, very small percentage of the overall uh, population in Canada in, uh, in 2050. So the question then is, will you have any influence in government at all, especially at the federal level? So let's look back at some of the changes very quickly before I go down to where, where I think we're going to be. So in 1971, we had the Alberta Wheat Pool, Saskatchewan Wheat Pool, Manitoba Wheat Pools. We had United Grain Growers. You had the Canadian Wheat Board. You had a lot more provincial federations of agriculture, uh, Canadian Federation of Agriculture, Canadian Cattle Association, the Canadian Swine Council, Dairy. Those are the groups that were around in 1971. Um, because I'm looking at 40 years, I went back 40 years. That's, that's who was doing sort of the lobbying for the farmers back then. Uh, government was very sensitive. There's a lot more cash bailouts. Those of us who were there through the uh, 70s and 80s. Well, I wasn't there in the 70s so much, but I was there in the 80s. Uh, there was, government was very active. There's a lot of lobbying. Roy Romano came to power and, we, and he chartered a big airplane and there was three reps from every farm group. We all flew down to Ottawa told all the MPs, we don't get a billion dollars in cash by the time we leave in three days, there won't be a crop, we won't go on the ground this year. That kind of stuff went on and on and on. We filled the uh, the Agrodome, we had a rally here, we filled it standing room only. And that Agrodome with farmers from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta showed up to lobby for that billion dollars. They filled uh, the Saskatoon, uh, the hockey arena, like that kind of stuff happened a lot. Manitoba had huge rallies too. Today, just, just 20 years later, you'd have a hard time getting that sort of rally out there. And in, in, in 30, 40 years, there won't be that many people to have a rally. Jump ahead 40 years, uh, many of these cooperatives, so that's just to today now. A lot of those cooperatives are gone. Those pools are gone, UGG's gone, uh, King Wheat Board's gone, uh, or, and there's some, some co-ops like Federated Co-op and other co-ops out there, but they're not, they're not involved in the politics as much. And you see that in Ontario too, they're just not involved in the politics, they're just there running their businesses. 
Um, some federations of agriculture have waned in influence. Um, some are still strong, but uh, some of them have, have lost a lot of influence in, in policy. Um, Commodity associations. So here's the group that's grown in the last 40 years, the Canola Council of Canada. Uh, these sorts of organizations, Pulse Canada, they've really taken hold of their industries and they're running with things. You've got wheat commissions, uh, barley commissions, canary commissions. That's where it's gone and that's where government has gone too because at the end of the day, general farm organizations don't actually sell grain overseas. They don't do that market development work. They work on farm policy well, but in terms of actually developing your sector and your industry, that's where the commodity associations have really excelled in the last 40 years. Uh, we have Pulse, Beef, Pork, Wheat, Barley, Dairy, all, all of those groups have uh, they've got the ear of the government now. So 2050, over 95% of the people will be general public, largely disconnected. We talk now about how they're disconnected. Given another 40 years, people will even be far more disconnected from, from who we are in agriculture. They're going to expect you to farm in ways that conform to their views. We talk about social license, but there's a lot of views out there in the urban population, and you only have to go overhear some conversations in a restaurant somewhere or in a coffee shop to understand people how people think we should be farming. And they have these Norman Rockwellian sort of views of you and your pitchfork and three three chickens and you know some sheep and on and on and on. But people think you well, why don't you farm that way? There's a lot of that out there. And on social media, you'll see it all. If you just go to hashtag GMO and just look what people are saying about genetically modified crops or go hashtag gluten-free or something like that and just see the stuff that goes on out there in the social media world, totally disconnected from any reality that those of us face on the ground every day. So between now, but here's, here's what I think is going to happen. So I am going to make bold predictions. Between now and 2050, there will be several food crises. And so, because you got a lot of people out there, we need GM labeling, got to stop GM crops, Monsatan is out there, you know, forcing farmers to buy seed, blah, 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 blah. That's all out there. There's a lot of that out there, trust me. But there is going to be some food crises. Prices are going to spike. And next time, if there's a serious, serious uh, food crisis in the world, security is going to get threatened because, you know, I forget what the philosopher was, the world is only like three meals away from anarchy in any country. The moment your children are going hungry and your wife is hungry, you're going to take action. And that's, and that's where, that's where we're going to have. We will have some food crises that I think are going to cause actual security issues in the world. Then, crops built to withstand weather will be far more accepted in the world. I think, I think governments then will override some of the nonsense that's going out, on out there. Uh, crops designed to be healthier are going to be far more accepted in the world by 2050. Crops will reduce food safety concerns and they will be accepted. So more disease resistance, however it's bred in genetic modification or other, or other processes, there's going to be far more acceptance after the next, after the next crises or two. Um, activists will still exist. They'll still push their agenda. They, they will, they will never go away. And, and they do, they do sometimes on occasion bring forward. Some good points on they'll push their agendas, but uh, the world population is increasing. There's the shift to meat diets that's going to continue to increase, and food production needs over 50 percent more. The fact is, those drivers are going to outweigh what the activists might want to do in terms of turning back how we farm to 1971. Um, government will insist that we demonstrate progress in helping fight climate change. I actually wrote this before the Liberals won their majority government, so there's my first prediction that was correct. So this, this, is, this is where we're going, and we can either be in front of this train or we can be uh, standing on the tracks with our hands up. But if you stand in front of this tracks, this train will drive over you. I guarantee it. Um, governments, so here's what governments do. You, as a commodity association, or as a, let's just say APAS, for example, in Saskatchewan or Fairfax, you cannot go to a foreign government and negotiate trade access. You can't do that. Only government to government, state enterprises like the states to state can actually negotiate certain things. So governments are going to stay focused on that. They will work on opening up trade negotiations. And then when you have phytosanitary barriers, if uh, the Europeans don't want to let beef in because they don't like the lactic acid wash on the carcasses or the floor drains and meat plants aren't close enough together or whatever it, the small phytosanitary things are, maybe they don't like some chemical we're using, and it's, whether it's irrelevant or not, you know, dangerous or not, it's another issue. But those phytosanitary barriers are out there. Trade associations can identify those. They can work with you. But at the end of the day, only the government can actually do some of those negotiations to resolve. So that governments will stay focused on that for the next 30, 40, years. Uh, they will respond with some money to natural disasters or uninsurable causes of loss. But I can tell you, we're not going back to having rallies of 10,000 farmers asking for a billion dollars cash or the crop won't go on the ground. Those days are gone. The, uh, even in, at the end of the wheat board, when they tried to 
they tried to have rallies. They, they, you couldn't get a thousand farmers out to meeting to save the wheat board. It, it, it was over. And when they had the first meeting in southern Manitoba and they could only get 250 people, I phoned the minister's office and said, it's done. The, the, it's over. The, it's, the wind is out of that sail. Some people won't like that. I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong what they did. I was going, the farm support wasn't out there anymore for those sorts of institutions. Farmers have grown in size. They're growing in professionalism. They're going to continue to do that. And there's less and less need for government to be stepping in with that sort of help. So I see a, a huge rise uh, going forward in uh, private business advisors, and uh, which leads to why do we even need a provincial department of agriculture almost, quite frankly. If people are going to go get business advisors, why do we need crop specialists in the provincial sector unless people want some sort of checking against the checker, so to speak. Uh, farm, farm management, like when, if you look ahead 30, 40 years, are we still going to have to have these sorts of conferences or will people be more sophisticated enough that they don't need this? Maybe we'll work ourselves out of jobs. Maybe we don't need nearly as many farm organizations when you get down to those numbers either because at the end of the day, you as a farmer in whether you're Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, you're the guy that's paying for pulse, the pulse checkoff, the canola checkoff, the wheat checkoff, the barley checkoff, the canary seed checkoff, the oat checkoff, the beef checkoff, the pork checkoff. You're paying for all of that. Everybody has an executive director. Everybody has a communications director. Everybody has offices. Everybody has travel. Everybody has meetings. I tell you, it's all coming into your pocket. And I think the day will come where you still need some of those groups, but there's no reason they can't work together far closer, share office spaces, share common goals. Um, Heather and I have even had this discussion about the Canadian Young Farmers and Farm Management Canada and 4-H, there's a lot of groups out there do it, working with young farmers. Does everybody have to do this or can we find ways to carve out areas of expertise that add value to us rather than duplication? So I see, uh, well, that's where I see things going in 2050. I look forward to the discussion and I have a, yeah, that, that's, that's where I am. So I've made some bold predictions and of course, as a lobbyist, I won't be around to actually be here and see if they come true or not. Thank you. And uh, Richard's predictions will come true because he did that in nine minutes and 49 seconds, so he was right on. Rob, can I come and talk to us about the public and farmers and perceptions? Yeah. Okay, 10 minutes, lots to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, Chekhov uh, was a guy on a Star Trek when I was growing up and now farmers have to deal with too many of them. Uh, this is my world. My world is uh, in airplanes and broad acre agriculture. This picture could be in uh, Australia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Canada. Uh, you see millions of acres and you don't see any people. How does it all happen? What happens with technology? There are a number of drivers that are going on. I'm going to go fast, but I'm going to say some things that need to be said. There's divisions going on in agriculture right now. Here are two of the biggest divisions in agriculture. One is between lifestyle farms and one is between commercial farms. The guys that are growing stuff and selling it in local farm markets are having to talk badly about the guys that are growing farmers in the field just so they can sell their crops at inflated prices. That's going on and it's creating a, a division in farm. The other thing going on at farmers right now is a division between those farms that are adopting technology and those aren't. Our research shows that farmers that are adopting variable rate technology are making on average $35 more an acre uh, than farmers who aren't doing it. Eventually that's going to change who owns the land. The problem is when it comes to society and, uh, and uh, agriculture, most people are just floating down a river. They don't think. They don't think about the big currents that are affecting life today. They don't think about the big technology currents. Those technology currents include this. This is a picture of internet traffic around the world. You can see the Canadian Hawaii, in Hawaii, you see the Canadian farmers. They're beaming back to check on their grain bin sensors. The reality is we live in a world of exponential growth. You've heard the word several times already this morning. We live in a world of massive data and exabytes of data being produced every two weeks, 15 minutes. When I grew up on the farm in the 70s, ideas had sex. I had an idea, I shared it with you, we come up with a new idea. Today, ideas have orgies that get an idea here. It's d developed in China and sold in Europe sometime in the same day. The reason all of that is happening is uh, vastly, vastly increasing amounts of computing power. Uh, right now, a computer is calculating at about 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 9th, uh, 10, to, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th calculations per second. By 2023 or 2025, a $1,000 laptop would be calculating at 20, uh, sorry, a 10 to the 16th calculations per second. That means a $1,000 laptop will be calculating the same speed as a human brain. A little bit slower for Ukrainians, but still in that range. So that changes everything. I'm Ukrainian. I can get away with that. So anyways, 
the, the point of it is a thousand dollar laptop calculating the same speed as a human brain. And by 2050, and I believe all of us will still be alive, Hugh, so don't worry about it. So 2050, a thousand dollar laptop will be calculating the same speed as the entire human race. And people don't want things to change. You see, in agriculture, there's a need for technology. And that was me on the farm. I actually did that with my dad and he kicked my ass around the field. But this is technology today. This is Terry Eberhardt. And Reed, you're in the picture here. Um, uh, this, this is September. Terry Eberhardt is a farmer from Langenberg, Saskatchewan. 11,000 acres, him and Harvey farm up there. And it is September. It's right in the middle of his harvest. And I asked Terry to come to a meeting in Sylvan Lake. And we were done the meeting, and we were on Sylvan Lake in September, in the middle of his harvest, drinking beer, watching his wife combine on the iPhone. It is a perfect world. <laughs> but that is the reality. That's technology today. And so if you tell most city people that you can watch a, a combine in the next province and, and in real time know what the yields are or know what's going on in the combine, uh, people wouldn't believe you. The problem is people have a romanticized view of agriculture that no longer exists. It's not 1960 anymore. And the people in this room are to blame for the romanticized view of agriculture that doesn't exist anymore. The artist that drew these two posters, I know, she is from Toronto, and she has done work for us at Strategic Coach. And so she comes in. She's a city person. I know her. And I noticed that on her drawings here, there are four pictures of little red barns. Branding agriculture has got to change. I was asked to speak to the Canadian farm business writers in Cal Calgary on September 24th. And they asked me what's they asked me to bridge the urban rural gap and I said the problem is in your logo it's all over the place the little red barn doesn't exist anymore if it does it exists as a storage shed or in the agritourism sector but it does not exist in agriculture in any meaningful way and we have to change the image of the round fender pickup truck and the farmer with bib overalls the problem we have is more people are talking about food but not many know what they are talking about and if agriculture is going to feed 9 billion people is not the question is, will we be allowed to feed 9 billion people? Because the question really is, who's in the driver's seat? Is it Dr. Uh, Joe uh, from uh, the University of Miguel, is he in the driver's seat? Or is a 16-year-old activist who's on Twitter, backed by her organic uh, parents, uh, who is spending time uh, calling for GMO labeling? You can't label GMO because it isn't an ingredient. Is she in the driver's seat? The reality is we find ourselves in a new era of needing to defend the social license of farming. And my main question is, will agriculture lose significant science to non-science? And you could use the word nonsense there. You don't have to go very far to realize that the new language in technology is not binary code of ones and zeros, it's ATCs and Gs. ATCs and Gs are the new programming code. It's being driven by the currents, the currents of computing power, data management, our ability to use artificial intelligence and connect these things together. In a recent survey, they surveyed Americans. 82% of Americans say that food containing GMO should be labeled. In the same survey, 80% of Americans said that food containing DNA should be labeled. So the question is no GMO or no it? This, que this question could also be no milk or no milk. It could be no gluten or no gluten. It could be no meat or no meat. It could be no nic neonicotinoids or no neonicotinoids. It could be no fertilizer or no pesticide or no pesticide. And it goes on and on and on and on. And the reason we have to do this is because people care. Who cares? This is who cares. This is the McDonald's glow in North America. We know that because we're doing a lot of data management with McDonald's right now. And data will be the key to creating transparency and creating connectivity and to creating support at farm level. And increasing amounts of data is happening at exponential rates. And what Dan was saying is true. The problem in most agricultural farms today is the data is disparate. It's not congruent. So sooner or later, farmers are going to have to make decisions on data platforms that will help them to make better decisions. Sensor technology will be everywhere, and we'll have in-field sensors, remote sensing technology. The problem with sensors is it can tell you what's going on, but it can't tell you what to do. 
Automation will happen. Farmers are facing manpower problems right now. And as sure as I'm standing here, we'll have manpowered or manless tractors and manless combines. And what would a combine look like if it was truly manless? Would it shade, change the shape and cost of a combine? I think it will. Precision agriculture will be cross-disciplinary and will have variable rate and uh, vast amounts of data with wireless data transfer. And something I've been coining called variable rate everything will be more than norm. Just as Neo did in his movie, The Matrix, where Neo moved between the physical and the digital realm, I'm trying to get farmers to think about moving between the physical and digital realms. I'm trying to get them to create what is a digital shadow of the farm. The fence is the physical farm, the shadow represents the data. The crispness of the shadow is dependent upon the accuracy of the data. The more accurate the data is, the more that that data is worth as it pertains to the farm. In a data-rich world, the best algorithm wins. So this is a prediction that I'm making, is that the amount of people who actually know what the hell is going on in agriculture to really understand it are going to decline. So we have to take the brain power of people who understand agriculture and stretch it over hundreds of thousands or millions of acres. How do you do that? How do you take an agronomist who does his shit and help hundreds of thousands of acres as opposed to tens of thousands of acres? Well, scalability, artificial intelligence, intelligence, um, uh, augment, uh, augmented reality, and connecting wisdom to data will provide us with the ability to automate and scale. Those are my thoughts for the year 2050. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, wasn't my expectation that we'd hear so much about data, but fits right into the, the future expectations. Okay, we have about 15 minutes for questions. If you have a particular question for Rob, he has a flight to catch, so he may disappear on us uh, fairly quickly in a few minutes. So anybody to the mics? Please let us know who you are and if the question is directed at one or other or all of the panelists. Here comes a question. Norm Hall. Uh, Richard, you, you made the point about, about with fewer farmers, uh, there may not be an ag department. We were talking with Hans about, about uh, Holland not having an ag department. It's part of their Ministry of Economy. Um, could you expand on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question, Norm. Yeah, if you look ahead uh, to where we're going with the numbers of farmers, do you, do you even need a federal department of agriculture? I mean, you could actually roll agriculture over and be part of Industry Canada. There's no separate department of mining or separate department of forestry at some of the federal levels, and they're big industries as well. You could take the whole, uh, at the agri-food part of agriculture, you could roll over towards Health Canada or put that in Industry Canada too. There's different different places already where, where people could go. And, uh, and, and maybe we're at a point where we hardly need a department of agriculture federally. I know, I know for this, that's a big change for us to think about, but uh, maybe as we look ahead, we don't need it. And I go back to, on our farm, 40 years ago, if I had a bug problem, I phoned my ag rep, the ag rep came out, he would have a look at it, and he'd go look at some neighbor's fields, and, and then we'd decide what to do about it. Today, I phone the Terra, or whoever I got my inputs from, and, they, and the agrologist comes out and looks at it. Uh, the ag rep, with all due respect, and I see one of my former ag reps here, the ag rep's probably the last person a lot of people would call now. So. So what, what role, I'd even challenge the people in the Department of Agriculture in Saskatchewan in 30, 40 years, what, what, what will you be doing that the private sector isn't already providing those services for? And how do you add value to farmers? Thank you. Uh, my question's for Rob. Uh, Rob, uh, I applaud your efforts for uh, what you're doing as far as uh, creating aware awareness for uh, GMOs. Uh, actually, um, as a farmer who has used GMOs in the corn industry since they were brought in, and today I've shifted away to non-GMO because I realized that food is a passionate buying decision. And in any other segment of uh, consumerism, we encourage choice, but yet agriculture is vilifying those uh, decisions for choice as a, at a consumer level. 
and uh, it's an emotional buying decision now is food. Can you elaborate on what you're seeing, what you're observing, and how that's sort of playing out? Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I wore my actually my 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 tie today. This is my Helix tie. But the the the, the point I'm making with uh, with the no GMO, no GMO, or no it is not really about GMO, and it's not really about Monsanto and Genoa Bear. It's not really about those issues. It's about the fact that people can can hijack a conversation and not based on science whatsoever and remove tools out of your toolbox. Uh, this is a very important thing because if you travel around the world and you're dealing with the, the bananas in, in uh, Uganda or the corn in Kenya or the cassava, those are stories that we don't relate to, but there is no cure. There's no cure for the citrus greening right now. Uh, people want uh, uh, no GMO uh, food, fine, uh, what is a GMO, first of all, and you can't define it. That's one of the biggest problems. It's one of the worst publicity things we've ever done in agriculture, uh, and, and most of the input companies will admit that we absolutely blew this thing coming out of the, because we didn't talk about the benefits to the consumer, and what we're needing right now is we need to talk about the benefits to the consumer about food that, that we're growing. And GMO is nothing to be scared of. We need to be able to commit, uh, talk to uh, consumers that it's merely an extension of the breeding process driven by the currents of technology that we enjoy everywhere else in our lives. Richard's going to follow this up. It's going to come to a head actually really quickly, I think, in Canada, because if you look at the mandate letter that the Minister of Agriculture got, he's going to create a national food policy. Creating a national food policy will bring all of this stuff out of the woodwork. The activists will be out there, and I think agriculture groups are going to have to engage really early on in this file to, to make the case for what is your food safe. Otherwise, you could end up with a national food policy that would, and it probably will strongly encourage local production, more local production and store shelves, which actually a lot of us would agree with anyway. But you end up with a lot of other strange ideas coming forward. Uh, that maybe, you know, 15% of all the land should be set aside for organics or, you know, you might come up with some stuff and maybe the market metrics, maybe the markets will take it there anyway on their own. But it's, so those are ideas will come forward and they'll be put, they'll be lobbied for, they'll be pushed through social media. That's the kind of stuff where farm groups are going to be ahead of the curve. And in fact, two months ago, as the federal election was winding down, uh, two of us in Ottawa, we were looking at where this thing was going. And so we actually called together the government relations people from, uh, the dairy, the eggs, the chicken, the beef, the pork, all the different grain commodities. We've got the food processors in the room. We've got Fertilizer Canada in the room. We've got Crop Life in the room. Uh, we've got food marketing, like the fresh produce marketing people. We brought Hort, Hort Canada. We brought everybody into the room and said, if the Liberals win a majority, this is where some of this stuff is going to start to come. And they've already talked climate change so much in the election. They're going to go there and they're going to make aggressive commitments on climate change. And then they're going to come back to Canada and go now. Who has to give up the pound of flesh? And I said, we're going to be a big target. So I said, so this was even well before the election results were known. We started working in Ottawa, bringing everybody together because we're all in the same pot, no matter where you are in that sector of agriculture, that we got to get ahead of the curve on this. And we need to be going into federal politicians with roughly the same line from whatever sector you're in saying, here's how agriculture can help contribute to your climate change reductions. Here's the progress we've made in the last 40 years in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Like we have a good story to tell if we get to put the yardsticks down and, and measure from where we'd like to measure from. If you leave it to somebody else do it for you, it's going to be a lot harder for us to carry that forward. So we're already proactively doing that as farm leaders in Ottawa. But we're going to, at some point, we'll be coming out and through your associations, we're going to be reaching out to a lot of people to get hold of their members of parliament to work on this with us. Rob, you had a final word? Yeah, I've got a final word just to follow up on that. Instead of, instead of labeling what's not in the food, we should be labeling what's in the food. So what's the active ingredient? What's, what's the total pesticide active ingredient on your corn crop versus a GMO corn crop? What is the, what is the total pesticide load of an organic uh, corn crop versus those are the things that are important. Don't tell me what's not in the food. Tell me what's actually in the food. And we've got a long way to go with respect to education of the consuming public on these issues. A long way to go. Thanks. Mike over there. Yeah, Don Connick, a uh, grain and cattle producer in Saskatchewan here and a, a director from APAS. I'd like to direct this question to Dan. Uh, you showed us the difference uh, in, in, in terms of delivery. Uh, the grain doesn't come to the elevator with a horse and, and wagon anymore. It comes in a semi. But the grain that goes out of the elevator 
still moves the same old way. It's on rails, except uh, it's now diesel powered instead of steam. We haven't had any innovation in our infrastructure. It's still the same old railway system. It's still the same old highway system. We haven't changed the quality of pavement, etc. Uh, since 1960. Like, what do we have to do and where do we have to go to change our whole and improve our whole transportation system? That's a really, really good question. And it's, uh, it's something to think about, too, about the future of our business because we want to grow and produce more to service a growing market. But if you look at where the bottlenecks are, um, by increasing production in the prairies without having increased infrastructure to get crop to market, um, what would continue to happen is what we've seen in 2013, where basis levels basically go to go to a point where it discourages farmers from even delivering into the system. And what needs to happen is uh, we need more port capacity. Um, that's a, a bottleneck, and, and some private companies now are looking at that, like G3, uh, that one. Um, on the rail side of things, I'm not sure how. Um, there's a number of ideas that uh, that, that that could could work, uh, like joint running rights and things like that. But it's really tough with just having two two railways. Like we don't have a don't have a way of addressing surge capacity. Like in the in the states, um, you've got the river, so you can put more barges on the river. Uh, it's 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 a publicly owned waterway. Whereas in Canada, we have privately owned rails. So there's no way of increasing surge capacity. So I think things like what, uh, what Northgate, at Northgate, what they're doing with Sirius Ag, building a terminal that has access to another rail line, the BN, I think that that's critical for having extra surge capacity. So I think things like that. So any kind of initiatives that the, the government can do to increase competition for freight where in uh, of grain leaving Canada, would be uh, very beneficial for that, but it's it, we need to really address uh, what we do with the extra production because it's not just grain production; it's also uh, extra potash, extra forestry, extra oil, as we're seeing now with pipelines not being built. Uh, we just need to really look at okay, if we're going to be an export-dependent economy, which is which is fine, how do we actually get the volume moved to market that we need to move, and and it needs to be a conversation that uh, that that we're we're having. Thank you. And from the Fraser Valley, uh, a dairy farmer in BC and also a broiler producer here in Saskatchewan. My question was to Rob, but actually to all three. So now Rob's gone, so I guess it's to the other two. I know we just had our fall annual meeting uh, about three weeks ago and it came up from the board. Uh, and usually when it comes up in the last two or three years, most farmers and some city people, I guess I would say some, but are just looking uh, funny and, and questioning A and W on their ads. At, but at our meeting just uh, two weeks ago, the board and our CEO all said, this is what is going to happen. So I just wanted your perspective on that. Yeah, it's, it's happening. And that's why, like I said, with our group in Ottawa that we got together, when we saw this huge urban caucus, when you can see the train coming down the tracks a couple weeks before the elections, the numbers firmed up, we're like, wow, there can be no, literally no farmers left in the government, on the government side of the house. And so we need to be in front of that curve. Are you going to go out there and educate all those consumers? It's, that's not going to happen. But there's a lot of work to do with your elected officials who are the ones who set the policy and set the direction and, and put those rules and regulations in place. That's, that's where you can reach 338 people versus 30 million people. So there's, there's key pressure points I think we're going to have to be engaged. And so my, I would say one thing to everybody here, and that is I really encourage you to get active in a, in a farm organization, whether you ask Heather how you could help at FMC or whether you join Sask Pulse or Sask Wheat, your beef, your pork, your chicken, your dairy, whatever sector you're in, I really encourage you to go there because this urban, this, this is only the tip of the iceberg, you know, of where this whole thing is going. You, you, people from Alberta, I've got a bunch of farm groups out there, they're all mad about Bill C6 where they're going to have to have workers' compensation for everybody, including unpaid the unpaid labor all the volunteer labor in your farm that you contribute, you're going to have to make, make contributions on and the premiums on that stuff. There's, there's, this, this is where it's going. The new Nixon Ontario, it didn't matter what science was or what the common sense was. They're, they were going to they were going to stop using new Nix, and then perhaps in, there's a case we made it they were being overused. I, I wouldn't disagree with that, but but the draconian way that they go about it is going to change the way they uh, control pests in Ontario. That's the sort of stuff that's coming because. 
Um, you know, even in Saskatchewan, if this, let's just say Brad Wall gets caught doing something really, really bad, you know, if the government changed and the NDP came to power in Saskatchewan, it'll they won't win the rural seats. It'll be an urban population, even in Saskatchewan, that's going to win it. So you need to be active in your farm organizations. We need to have those proactive discussions. How do we tell the story, at least to the elected officials and to key editorial boards and the places where you can actually make a difference and get your message out? How do we go out there and say, here's how we're contributing to climate change reduction. Here's how we're doing safe food. Here's the things that we're doing to, to prove better. That's where you can get your stories in. Um, I hear people talk about educating the general public. Oh, good luck. That's a pretty big group to educate. But there are places where we can make a lot. But it takes people like yourselves. The fact that you even came to this conference is a good sign because you wanted to learn about better management. And being active and proactive through your organizations is a great way to continue on with that. Thank you. Did you have anything to add? Or? No, that's fine. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard. It's, again, good to see you. Finally connected all the dots. It took me a while. But uh, one of the things that's not been mentioned in our future look is where is public research going? And do you see uh, continued decline or elimination of public research in agriculture? Because it seems to me if we lose that public research, we're going to lose a lot of, of uh, uh, credibility uh, in the outside world because it will be the private industry that's driving it, who then has a profit margin at the end. And so if government continues to uh, limit private research, uh, with an, or not private, public research, where will that, uh, you know, where do you see that going? Because that's where the Ministry of Agriculture yeah. in federally is needed. Yeah. Uh, well, when it's with the Green Gorse Canada, we, 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 we agree with Jerry Rich on a number of files. This is an area where we strongly disagreed with the minister and, and went out and fought with him on, on cutbacks to public research. What they did to simplify this, they simply, they took a lot of the public research and they reprofiled it into why are we as government scientists, why do we have government scientists kind of, you know, blue skying and doing things? Why don't we go have them work directly with the Canola Council of Canada? What are, Canola, what is your needs? What are your highest priorities to work on in wheat? And so they went through kind of more of a sector orientated and sector directed research, which is fine, except a lot of it ends up being very short term research in smaller pieces. And you're missing the big blue sky pieces about where you might go. And so I think it would be uh, incumbent, and I think most farmers would support that uh, a return to a strong public research component. Doing the upstream work, um, I don't know if Ag Canada, I don't think they'll ever go back to actually going through to the full variety development and then having your, your, a, your Agriculture Canada wheat varieties and all that. I think those days might might go, but the key upstream research, which the private sector will not fund because it's so high risk, there's a huge role for public uh, government dollars, federal or provincial, to do that sort of work. It's just, it's really needed. And so that's something we should fight for. So yeah, I'll jump in. I'll add. Um, it's really, really important that we make sure we keep funding for the basic research that the public uh, companies and public um, uh, public organizations are doing. The basic research is done, and, and it's a good example is even the creation of canola. Basically, we're the canola economy now in Western Canada, but that double O variety made by Dr. Downey, that was done in a Canada research station, public research. If we get rid of or reduce the funding of, of basic research in public institutions, there won't be the ammunition left for the transformative changes that can happen to change our industry going forward. So it's very, very crucial that we maintain that. Um, private research, uh, it's usually only invested if you can see a clear path to commercialization. And uh, sometimes on these basic things you can't. So we need to make sure we keep the funding in place for basic research. The other, the other piece, the last little piece on research is it's not even necessarily research. You look at a position like Tom Wolf, who is the, the, the nozzle guy, who, who, who went out there and tested all the sprayer nozzles, and he had the track here at the University of Saskatchewan. They had the sprayer track indoors, and the government cut that position. We just we went to war with Jerry Ritz on that one. This was the Honorable Jerry Ritz, but uh, we went to war on that with him, and, and, and at the end of the day, they still cut it. But there's, there's people in the public sector, and if it was a role for agriculture publicly, is to, is to do those neutral checks. There's a neutral source versus the actual guy selling you the nozzles. Of course, this is always you know, it's the best things in sliced bread. So there is places to do that sort of neutral checking and fact checking for us. So there is a role out there beyond core research in sort of that other, other piece of uh, technical research as well. Last question before the break. Um, my, my question was uh, more for Richard. Do you see the government becoming more involved in 
how and, and what we farm. This might go past 2050 to ensure that we are we are feeding the the growing population of the world. Um, I, I I actually think they'll do. I think they will realize at some point they can probably help us more by by doing less, and and, that, and not trying to get in and, and manage and, and direct us the way we farm. I, I think that's where it'll go, and I think it'll take, not maybe not until there's a food crisis or two, but I tell you, in I, I worked I've worked in Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, I worked in northern Afghanistan, Tajikistan, I've worked in Nicaragua, and I tell you, it only takes one or two crises and the prices to spike. And, and there's going to be a lot of unrest, and then I think people are going to say, "Look, we simply have to have these. We simply have to have the new technologies. We simply have to produce the volumes." I think that's where it's going to go, and government will say, "How do we just help you to do that, rather than trying to direct you to do it?" What, what are the barriers blocking us from growing 100 bushel canola, 75 bushel wheat? Like, what do we need to do to get there? 300 bushel corn. Like, what, what's it going to take to get there? And I think they'll work with us at that point. You know, in, in Canada, there could be a, a, a spike in food prices. But because a lot of our food, there's a lot more processing going on here, the actual core ingredients, there's like seven or eight cents of corn in a box of corn flakes. So even if the price of corn doubled, your price of the box of cereal won't double. Like if it'll go up, but it's not like that. If you're in most of the world where you're eating corn tortillas, if the price of corn doubles, the price of your tortilla doubled, and that was actually your breakfast. So it's a huge, huge, huge effect when prices spike on people in the developing world as compared to in the north, what I call the northern hemisphere. Good, thank you both. Did you have anything to add on that, Dan? No? no. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for our panelists for uh, their uh, contribution. We learned that I'm going to live to 100 years old. We didn't learn anything about the Maple Leafs, which is probably a good thing. Um, it's interesting about the data. Um, anybody that puts an app on their smartphone, the first question is, can, can whoever owns that app use your data and uh, you raise that question about who's going to own that data that's going to be so important in making some of these decisions. So that's uh, the digital the digital shadow of the farm I think is going to be quite uh, important into the into the into the future and uh, also to echo I think uh, uh, Richard's point of view about getting involved uh, 20 years ago to become an activist took quite a bit of dedication and time and now you need a smartphone with a Twitter account and you've got hundreds of thousands of followers just for saying something stupid. Uh, it's a real challenge to uh, address that. And so I think that's one of the most important messages out of this is regardless of what's coming in 2050, uh, get engaged and be involved. Okay, thank you very much.